graduate student at the University of Michigan's History of Art Department, and I'm one of the co-curators on this exhibition, Out of the Ordinary. And I'm here today with Bruce. Hi, I'm Bruce Conforth, a faculty member in the Program of American Culture. And we're here today to talk about the relationship between folk art and American roots music. are looking today at the Out of the Ordinary exhibition at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Out of the Ordinary as a title was chosen to highlight how these objects are often not found in museums. They're often objects that you can't see in a kind of institutional museum display. Ride, wheel, and cut the fool and love again all over. Right now we're looking at William Blackman and he actually was born in Michigan. Uh, grew up in Albion, Michigan, and later on in his adult life ended up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and really his career was as a street preacher and as a pastor uh, in the African American community in Milwaukee. But part of that, he eventually just started painting signs on one of the buildings he was renting. Um, and eventually these signs were recognized by uh, the wife of the director of the Milwaukee Art Museum as uh, a work of art. Um, and that really began his career as an artist, which he didn't start, uh, really didn't start for him until he was 63 years old. Some of the things that are so fascinating about him, he always uses text. So he's communicating both through the visual and the verbal. But it's also that he is very much connected to the community he lives in. The work that he does really is about um, admonishing or helping people in his community towards good manners, towards spiritual growth, towards spiritual health, community health. Um, and so he ends up really working between um, spiritual and secular realms. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting point because it's, it's precisely that dynamic between the spiritual and, and the, the secular that, that relates this so perfectly to American roots music and specifically the blues as in the tradition of Robert Johnson who the, the UMS um, Roots Music Series is going to be featuring in February. Um, Delta musicians, blues musicians uh, in the 1920s and 1930s often served a very social role within their community, almost as, as community social workers. And they, they had this interplay between the spiritual and the secular. Uh, many of them were preachers in their part time. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's the combination of, of this tension between these two messages um, of the world, yet beyond the world. People like Sun House, Robert Johnson's mentor, uh, was a preacher in his spare time. He used to tell the story, for instance, about how he'd go to a juke joint in, in the Mississippi Delta and start playing on a Saturday night, play all night long until Sunday morning, stop playing on Sunday morning, give a a sermon, preach a sermon to the assembled crowd, and then they'd all just go back to juking again. So we see this tension, this, this spiritual secular tension throughout American roots music. So right now we're looking at two works by a very famous folk art painting family, um, Mose Tolliver's The Father, and he's on the left. Um, he also came to his life, started painting later in life. Uh, it was after he was handicapped by a work accident and could no longer work that he took up painting. Um, and he be eventually became so popular that in fact he couldn't keep up with the production requests for his paintings. So he uh, trained his daughter Annie, who we see on the right, to also paint, uh, to help him fill his orders basically that were pouring in um, from art collectors. Self-portraiture has a very long history in Western art painting and in the canon of Western art. And here we see artists give very different kinds of depictions of themselves. It's that, it's that notion of self-reflexivity that I find very fascinating and, and very, very aligned with much American roots music. Because if you think about the blues, if you think about country music, so much of it is focused on the I. I have the blues today. I lost my baby. I lost whatever it is. And, and in many ways, the self-reflexivity of American roots music is what ties it to its very authenticity. And so these, these pieces um, are not just expressions, I think, of, of the artist, but, but kind of an authentic representation of them 
to them. And that's precisely what people like Robert Johnson, again, blues musicians, um, the Carolina Chocolate Drops in representing the string band tradition, um, Roseanne Cash with, with the great canon of the, of the list of, of country music songs. It's, it's that great homeopathic self-reflexivity of curing whatever it is by representing it with what it is. So with most Tolliver, uh, really complicated issues actually erupt in the art world around him and his work, which his work itself may not look that radical, but the issues around him certainly are. One is that he was a group, um, part of a group of African American artists who came to attention in the mainstream due to a show in Washington DC at the Corcoran Gallery. And it made it a series of Southern uh, folk artists extremely popular and highly in demand, which is why he could not fill all his orders anymore uh, for his paintings. Um, but a lot of controversy because a number of these painter, painters, including most Tolliver, were illiterate African Americans um, who certainly lived um, below the poverty line um, before they became famous at the Corcoran show. Um, and suddenly they had national acclaim. They uh, were in high demand for art collectors. Um, who still were paying relatively very little money. The mainstreaming of genres like the blues or even country music is, is a very frequently problematic issue. Um, artists like Robert Johnson um, or, or the, the Tennessee Chocolate Drops who, from whom the, the Carolina Chocolate Drops took their name, these artists were, were to a large extent exploited by, by white record producers, mainstreamed. The, the artists themselves were, were largely forgotten until the 1960s, um, which was a reappropriation of culture, m largely by, by white college-aged um, uh, youth. And, and so there, it, it's a very complex issue as, as to you know, where does the artist's work leave off? Where does cultural reappropriation take on? Um, how, do we, how do we relate to an artist whose work was basically shaped by someone who was trying to exploit their work in the first place? How do we go back and, and construct them instead of viewing them as myth? How do we reconstruct them as, as the real people that they were? It's, it's, it's a, 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 a tremendously multifaceted argument that probably can never truly be solved. Sherman Landon is a southern uh, woodcarver who also picks materials out from his yard. In this case, he's using sticks that he found in his front yard uh, to create the red devil bird that we see here. Um, and he is also in a tradition, uh, a communal tradition that's been passed down in time. There's a very strong wood carving tradition in the American South, and he pictures himself as part of that. That's really interesting. Of, of course, the idea of using found objects is, is one that's not uncommon in the musical tradition as well, for, because many, many musicians um, in both the black and white traditions in the American roots music um, began their careers playing on diddly bows, which were basically one string nailed to a barn siding, um, plucked and, and, and played with a, a bottle for a slide, or they made their own, their own homemade cigar box guitars. Uh, what I find particularly interesting about this piece, of course, is, is that it's a red devil bird, which also speaks to the hoodoo tradition which is so much a part of the blues tradition out of which Robert Johnson came. Uh, Johnson, more than any other blues artist, uh, steeped his lyrics in, in hoodoo um, folklore. Out of the 29 songs that we know that he recorded, almost half of them contain references to hoodoo, devil, mojo bags, um, all sorts of, of, of great mystic underpinnings that, that come from the Deep South and, and that have been borrowed from African traditions mixing with Christianity. You know, this piece by Ronald Cooper is really a wonderful piece and it's so indicative of the kinds of items one would have found in the folk churches in the Appalachians. Um, and of course that is is a, is a direct link to the music of people like Roseanne Cash, 
um, and, and the people who came out of the Piedmont region. Uh, this, this whole folk art, folk religion, um, folk music tradition was, was very, very heavily pronounced um, in, in, that, in that region. And so when, when I see this, uh, I can almost hear the shaped notes singing, the, the sacred harp singing, from which the Carter family got many of its influences, which would then, of course, go on to become part of Johnny Cash's great list of 100 songs and ultimately feed into, into his daughter Roseanne's tradition. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful visual link between, like I said, the, the folk art, the folk music, and the folk religion of the Appalachian era. A folk tradition that's really, um, some would say, taking the religion to the people, right, and on the people's everyday level. Um, and what people respond to, not necessarily the grand chapels of Europe here, but really a kind of immediacy um, to the work itself that people can relate to. You know, Christine, for me, one of the most exciting parts of coming into this exhibit was seeing this piece by Purvis Young of three guitar players because the image was so incredibly iconic of street musicians from the 1920s and 30s that it immediately struck a chord within me, no pun intended. And one of the chords it struck was of this wonderful photo from the 1920s of one of the groups that influenced the Carolina Chocolate Drops and the whole Piedmont music tradition, Peg Leg Howell and his gang. And you can see they're standing by a brick wall in an, in an urban environment, very much like what Purvis Young is depicting here some 40, 50 years later. And, and I think that that time relationship, the fact that we've got an image from the 20s that relates so directly to something that was, that was relevant and current for someone painting in 1997, um, that we have this great connect in, in the American roots music tradition. It was that great connection across time, across genres, across place, across people, that really tied this whole thing together for me. We've seen how artists have represented themselves. We hear how artists represent themselves musically. Now it's our time. It's our time to pay attention to how we're relating to what they're saying and how they've presented themselves visually. Well, and we've just gone through our own reflections on the artwork and the, some of the music that has connections here. But uh, we'd love to really hear what viewers uh, think about these connections and what kind of connections they might make as they experience the music in the UMS season and as they come to UMA and look at the artworks on the walls. Because that is what reaches out across time. It's not just the work, but it's our response to it. Great point.